and welcome to Collaboratory, the show where Mike Morris improvises an animatic with a little help from our audience, and we learn about the craft of storyboarding along the way. This is an improv art stream that runs on audience suggestions. Mike, what kind of prompts are we looking for today from the Hi, Laura. <clears throat> so um, just to be clear, um, this show, this episode of Collaboratory is going to be a little bit different. We are going to be talking about 3D today. We are going to be incorporating 3D elements into our storyboard. And so we have a setting all picked out. As you can see here on, on screen, we have this lovely airship. Actually, uh, Laura here uh, did the 3D modeling for it. And uh, we are going to be using that as a setting. But we still need two things. We need two characters and a conflict. OK, two characters and a conflict. So please feel free, audience, to jump in with your suggestions. Whatever you type, we might pick, and it'll show up on screen. To give some inspiration, one of our most recent episodes featured a mental health Sasquatch. So while we wait for some suggestions to roll in, um, Mike, I have some, I want to chat a little bit with you about 3D in storyboarding. Um, how often do you encounter 3D in storyboarding? Um, for me, probably not as often as others, but I know that some people do it like all the time. Um, 3D is especially helpful when you have things like vehicles, such as this airship, or you have um, like uh, a set that is going to be something that you reuse over and over and over again. And that's, that's pretty helpful. Um, sometimes if there's like a specific object or prop that needs to be like on model for for sure um then 3d can be very helpful there too i imagine it's probably more common on in a 3d in a three animated 3d show than an animated 2d show but would you be given maybe um some 3d objects for a 2d show would that be a thing um yeah absolutely i mean it, 3D is becoming, well, it, it already is. It's more and more and more um, the standard of, of operation. So, I mean, working in, in 3D in storyboards um, is just one of those things that, uh, you know, it, it's becoming more and more 3D intensive. So with- Do you the, think with, that's a, is that, is that a gift or a curse? Uh, I don't know, because, like, because not everything requires 3D. You know, not, not mm -hmm. everything is gonna need it. Mm -hmm. um and you can do a lot of 2d tricks to sort of simulate that but as uh things more and more go into 3d software packages um you know maya i don't know how much 3ds max is used for cinematic stuff as, as opposed to games but i mean blender is really showing up to the table too um mm -hmm. this is this you modeled this in blender if i'm not mistaken i did yeah yeah cool so blender is showing up to uh as as a you know, viable option for a lot of studios to just sort of go all free and um, and use some amazing software that keeps evolving at a rapid pace. Yeah, um, this is a particular, this is a 3D model that was imported into Storyboard Pro, which is a really nice feature to have. But I know you have some yeah. experience with making a 3D set in straight in Storyboard Pro using 2D planes. Did you want to talk yes. a little bit about that? Absolutely. You know what? Uh, instead of talking about it, why don't we just show it? Okay. So um, I think we, we can um, set up a scene already without um, having to put characters in it quite yet. So I'm going to start a new scene right here. And then um, I'm going to push Shift M so um, we can zoom in on, on the scene here. All right. So I think what we're going to do, first of all, is put in some sort of uh, background. I think... Um, some sky will be really helpful here. So um, I'm going to use the um, the shape tool here. I'm going to use the rectangle, and we're just going to draw a big old giant rectangle and use the auto fill feature. Let me get rid of that uh, extra bit of line here. And um, oversize this. I'm going to oversize it so where it's way, way, way bigger than we actually need it to be because um, we, want it to, we want it to have a, a good deal of coverage. So way, way bigger than what the screen would actually require. 
All right. So um, next we're going to import our 3D model as a 2D image. So if I go to my library here, I go to um, global, let's come in here, go to airship model, and I'm gonna drag the airship model into the stage. And it's gonna ask me, how do you wanna import it? I can use it as a 3D model or I can render to 2D. In this case, we're gonna render to 2D. So now I'm greeted with this little dialog box. It's gonna show me like exactly what do I wanna import. And then these translation tools that are going to, um, you know, move the ship in whatever position I want it to be in. So if I want it to be down a little bit, I'll go to Y. If I want to, um, you know, back and forth in the transformation, I do Z. And then here's the rotation. So I can rotate it this way. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the Z at zero because I don't know if I want that quite yet. And let's move this along to here, um, rotate it not so drastically. And then we're gonna zoom in on, on this here. And let's, let's level this out just a little bit. Sometimes it, it takes a minute to kind of get exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's composition. It's important. Yeah. Yeah, you have to compose it. And sometimes I like to um, get a little bit um, more of the angle than what I actually need. You can because, always crop in. Yeah, I can, always, I can always crop in after the fact. So we're just going to get a picture of this helm here. And then um, just tilt it a little, a little bit in the Z-axis, not the Z-axis, but the Y-axis. No, sorry, the x-axis. Give it that little tilt so we have a slight upshot. There we go. And then render to scene. And now in my scene, I have this. And now I can I can um, put my camera and zoom in just a little bit. And this, I'm working in the 3D space. So in this 3D space, um, and, and as far as workspace goes, you see that on the left, I have my camera view. On the right, I have my stage. And then there is a top view and a side view. So if you see these different um, these different layers here, I'm going to go to the top view. And then I'm going to get out a tool that is right here called um, the Maintain Size tool. Now, um, if I was to look, if I was to take the stage, move it over here, then you could see that this is just, you know, a couple of 2D planes. And then I'm going to move this back, this big layer back in space. You see that it's moving back mm -hmm. and also maintaining its size. That's pretty sweet. So now um, if, I, if I come in here, you can see as I use my 3D navigation tool that I have two different planes operating at the same time, right? And that in that way you can get some good like parallax movement. So um, on layer A, I'm going to go back to the camera view here. Okay. On layer A, I'm going to just uh, put in a, a placeholder character until we have something that uh, somebody is putting forward. So we do have a suggestion if you're ready for it. Oh, we do. What is it? Yes, um, the suggestion is the character could be Cupid, since we have Valentine's Day recently, so Cupid. Mm -hmm. And then someone, the conflict would be someone is shooting at the ship that Cupid is driving. Mm. So someone's trying to sabotage love. Who is sabotaging it? Uh, that's a good question. Audience, do you have any suggestions? Maybe we Cap can, Maybe it'll be a reveal. Captain Cupid and his... Love ship. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so then we could put, uh, I'm going to get this just a, a bit of a smaller. Simon31 suggests his girlfriend. Ha ha ha. 
Maybe an oh. ex. So this is maybe a tragic a, tale. A rival Cupid, maybe a rival Cupid. I'm assuming she's also a Cupid, but maybe not. I don't know. Maybe she's the Tooth Fairy. <laughs> Let's see. Captain Cupid. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm going to get so an even a, smaller brush. Instead of a skull and crossbones, we could have a, a heart and two arrows. A heart and two arrows. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We'll go with the uh, the CalArt style design. Sure, sure. We'll brim of the hat, and then uh... nice big fluffy feather. I like it. So. I am always impressed with your your visual library, Mike, and how you just have, you're always able to come up with interesting and appealing and clear designs, not only for characters, but for sets and props and in what have you. And like, I think we had one where you had to draw like an underwater car or something like that. And you just came up with something on the spot and it was, it was amazing. And totally, that's absolutely an underwater car. Um, and I, so I'm, I'm curious how you've developed your um, visual library over the years and how often, if you, when you're on the job, how often are you looking up references and things? Well, um, I, you know, reference is really important and, and building up a, just a visual library in your own mind about different things. Um, and I think it's also important to sort of take a logical approach to design sometimes um, because you won't always have that visual library. So in the case of the underwater car, I mean, what would you need to have an underwater car, right? Like what would it, what would it need? It would need, you know, a chassis and wheels. It would need something to keep whatever is aquatic alive inside. So some, you know, some sort of big tank. Um, and, and I think everyone's backgrounds is different. I'm, you know, I, I come from a background where, um, uh, my father was in, in construction for a long time. And so, a lot of that sort of like physical aspect I'm, f I'm very familiar with, you know, the light bits of engineering and things like that. And I, and I think bringing your experience to your storyboards um, really helps quite a bit, you know, it's very cool. so having, having a little bit of uh, experience behind you is, is, is a great thing. So do you have a, a um, a specific genre of things that are that you would be more comfortable with or least or less comfortable with based on your your current mental library gosh i don't know horror probably is my weak Ooh. spot I'm, I'm not a big horror guy so um whatever whatever horror sort of things i do tend to be more on the like universal side you know like universal studios type stuff with dracula and frankenstein and all oh, that sure, stuff sure. not this like Amity horror or whatever, <laughs> you know, where everybody's getting uh, chopped up by a puppet or whatever. Let's give him some some good swashbuckler boots because he yes. is a captain after all. And you know what? Uh, let's uh, let's give him good l large like commanding type wings. Excellent. Is, is that a diaper I see? The little picking guy through as well. What? Is that a diaper I see picking through as well? Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, he's got to have he's got to have the weirdo diaper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then so um, he he also needs his his uh, quiver of arrows here, so we'll put that right here on on the other side of the wing, because ostensibly the wings would come from like, uh, you know, right in the middle of his back, about shoulder blades. -ish. Yeah, right between the shoulder around the shoulder blades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we've got this. And we are going to um, we're going to add a couple of clouds. 
And I'm just going to get a, uh, a, a nice big texture brush for that. Ooh. So I've got this marker brush here. And uh, I'm going to turn off um, the light so I can see what I'm doing a bit better. And then we're going to put in some you know, clouds here. I'm going to turn that, that um, you know, autofill off. Autofill is great, but sometimes it sort of will mess up texture brush stuff. So not always the the right decision for that. Um, and I'm going to go back to my um, stage view, which oddly enough is here now, and put my camera view back where it was on this side. So you're going to be jumping back and forth a lot between different views in when you're using a 3D workflow more so than yes. the average workflow, yeah? Absolutely. So um, when you're using the, the 3D workflow, definitely you'll be jumping back and forth uh, quite a bit between camera and um, and your, your stage view and such. All right, so um, let's see here. We've got um, these clouds. And now one thing that I'm going to need to do when I'm working on these clouds and and I can't really draw on them. You see this, uh, you know, um, forbiddance that I've got going on here. <laughs> it's forbidden. Yeah. So um, I have to use this little button down here that's called "Look at Selected." When I push "Look at Selected," that gives me back, you know, my um, my ability to draw again. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna just gonna put in some some various clouds. You know, I'm gonna put some on one level here, like this. My clouds tend to all look the same. So I'm going I'm to try and branch that out a little bit so it's not all looking exactly the same. We have uh, another additional suggestion of uh, Cupid has a new girlfriend, and he is telling the new girlfriend to hide because they're being attacked by his old girlfriend, the ex. Ooh. Ooh, now some intrigue, some real some <laughs> real, real craziness. Cupid, Cupid's a player, apparently. It's Cupid. <laughs> then is so it about like, real love or is it just lust uh, maybe he's got different arrows for different purposes <laughs> uh, could be a tricky guy i mean he he does go around messing with people's lives quite frequently so um so when you are working on um an, an average production do you give it 2d or 3d uh, how often are you given a set? Um, how often do you have to make up the the environment completely by yourself based off of just a prompt? Um, well, in boards, sometimes that's like kind of the gig, you know, where you're you're coming up with stuff, just the rough design. Sometimes they have a, what's called pre-design. And pre-design is really helpful. Like if the showrunner has a very specific idea of what they want to do, then um, they can you know, sort of say, well, designers, this is your gig. You're going to do such and such. And, and, and I want this design to look this way, you know, like a specific way. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you'll get a, like a pre-designed packet in your storyboard. They did that quite a bit on, uh, on DuckTales, which was great because we had amazing designers on DuckTales and, um, they were, they were really, really awesome. If you ever get a chance, uh, to check, him out. He was on um, Cartoon Crunch, uh, a fellow by the name of Luciano Herrera, and he is fantastic. That's awesome. So, would you get would you get like a um, a line art background, or would you get maybe a top down uh, like map of the layout? What would you What would you get? It really depends on what it is. It was a, um, oftentimes, it'll just be like a painting, like a finished background painting. Uh, sometimes. Well, not like a finished background printing, but more like concept art. Concept art. Yeah. That's cool. Concept art. All right. So here's what we're going to do with this one. Now we've got a couple of uh, a couple of layers here. And if I was to start monkeying around with the camera a bit and uh, moving it. So I'm going to, um, with, with our camera here, it's a little bit different than what we see in our normal view because now we've got like a focal length, right? And as we select the camera, now we have this uh, 3D thing here. And as Ooh. we move our camera, 
we've got this uh, like built-in parallax that we've got going Look at on. That. That's awesome. So, um, but we need a little bit more space. We need a little bit more space. So, um, and unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to do like everything we want to do with a normal collaboratory because uh, 3D does take a little bit more time. We're just going to stick this farther in the background here. Boop. And um, we're going to give these clouds a little bit more space. Look at that. That's See, and, so it, and it, and then and, and right here on the camera view, you notice that the, Nothing changes, right? Nothing changes. But you can changing. see in the other view that it's. But you can see hitting. it in the 3D view. So it's and compensating it, for the distance with the size. Absolutely, it's compensating. That's so awesome. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull these other closer clouds back a little bit, so they um, are a little bit closer, and we get that really nice parallax we're looking for. Another another trick we can do also is for these layers that are right here. Um, we're gonna go and open up the actual layers palette. You, uh, you know, most people just use this one right here that's uh, connected to the stage. But if we use the actual layer palette, we can do this little, um, push this little button here called pin to camera. So it'll align the camera layer to the camera, or it'll align that layer of artwork to the camera and it won't go anywhere. So we're gonna pin that. Um, and then we are gonna like sort of recompensate for what we did there. Um, and uh, make that a little bit bigger. So if I go to my tool properties, I'm going to select this and we're going to expand it by 1.1 1 .1 across the board. So we can get back that scale that we had before. All right, and here we go. Now, where is our layer here? So our guy is down here, and now oh, we need to it. match match him up. Um, so we're gonna also do him at 1.1, 1 .1, and then 1.1, 1 .1, and then 1.1, 1 .1, and then move him back into his proper position. So to do that, we're gonna use the uh, camera view here. And also, I'm going to do this button here, which is create uh, center pivot on selection. So now I'm gonna have my my controls right here on the character himself. So is the character itself now a 3D object? Yes. Ooh. Yes, he is. I'm gonna shrink him down a little bit so he, so he, he fits where we had him before. I don't wanna, I don't wanna turn him, but I just wanna have him right here. All right, cool. So that's taken care of now. You got some compliments. Your, the background is beautiful. Um, and uh, we have a couple more things. Uh, suggested that the ex-girlfriend pulls out a machine gun and uh, warns Cupid to stop the boat. And another one saying that Cupid and the new girlfriend find her threats funny and they don't take her seriously. Mm. Well, you know, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. All right. So um, let's go over here. We're going to go back to the layers layers tab. And I'm going to move. Oh, oops. I forgot. There's one thing I did forget. I need to take this and this. See, the, um, the stacking of the layers in the 3D doesn't quite matter as much because it's all about the 3D position in space. So now I'm going to take these two and I am going to... Um, put them into a folder together. So I'm gonna group selected layers, so now they're in a folder. And I'm not gonna move the, the characters, I'm just gonna move anything with them in the folder, all right? So that folder is going to be tied to these, these two. Now when I'm- So move, how, do you, how do you move the folder? This one's gonna be pinned to camera as well. Sometimes there's a little bit of readjustment that you have to do whenever you pin anything to camera. You just have to sort of fix it a little bit and uh, it'll get back to where it needs to be. And then I can just- A little bit more setup, but you don't have to draw a background. <laughs> yeah, with, with my, uh, it, yeah, it's definitely a little, a little bit more setup. You, you, you for sure have to, do your due diligence in setting things up. 
So I'm going to come back up here to my number three vector ballpoint pen, which I've been sort of partial to lately, and finish out um, Cupid's setup here. So if you were going to be drawing a 2D background or set for your storyboards, would you be tempted to use some 3D to um, get just really easy uh, perspective, per perfect perspective um, automatically with your with your background? Sure. I mean, you, you can, people do that all the time. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Because I know you that, know, that uh, Storyboard Pro has some awesome uh, in-program guides, like perspective guides and stuff that you can use as well. Um, and so I'm not for sure, sure, like for you, for yourself, what do you, uh, have you tried both? I, I, I am more partial to the perspective guides myself, um, just because that's kind of like the tradition that I'm from is, mm -hmm. you know, more of the 2D tradition. So um, that's what I use generally. Um, but if there's something that's a little bit more tricky, then, mm -hmm. then I, will, I will do the other. So, all right. So let's see. This. Let's just get him in there a little bit. All right. And of course, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, messing around with it that you'd have to do. But um, now we've got this scene here. And we are going to go to the stage view, or rather to the top view, and then push Shift M on this so we see the whole the whole stage. Um, we are going to push in on on the camera a little bit here. So the camera is going to be pushed in. Oh well, actually, we need to do a couple things. Getting it all set up. So layers, this layer here has to come closer to camera. Ooh, look at that. Yep. It's a dynamic. Pretty scene. neat. Right? OK. And I'm also going to um, go back to my tool properties and center the pivot on the actual, on the actual scene. Uh, it helps quite significantly. Get that back into its proper perspective. And you can see where the parallax, you know, comes into play as these things move around. You can tell that they're not, you know, right on the same layer. Mm -hmm. So if I go back to my layers or back to um, here, I can see, oh, this guy is way far in front of that. So it's got to kind of come back a little bit. If you had a shot where the camera was zooming into the scene, would you prefer to do that with a th with 3D assets or with 2D assets on, on different planes in this kind of fake 3D um, setup? It really depends on the shot. It honestly yeah? just would depend on the shot. So I'm going to go shift M. Now I've got this, uh, this shot here, and I'm going to um, take that and, again, put him a little bit closer toward camera. See, now he's scaling at the right size since the, those mm -hmm. layers are like right on top of one another. All right, now we've got this. And so I can go like that. And remember, these, are, these layers are pinned to camera. So now when I take my camera and I take it all the way over here, zoom out a little bit. And now I'm going to use my tool properties. Actually, I'm going to go to, yeah, tool properties. And I'm going to put a keyframe down. So in the camera here. So are there any other major differences that you can think of between a 2D show and a 3D show? Um, like is I've heard that it's sometimes a 3D show is less um, less concerned with how on model you are with your storyboarding of their characters because they not going to change the model. Uh, sometimes, yeah. I mean, it, it all depends on who's directing. Mm -hmm. Some uh, some are a little bit more sticklers than others, but uh, you know. It, it just really, it really depends on the show, uh, quite honestly. 
All right, so let's give give him a little a little ways back. And again, your hand tool works beautifully here in this in this situation. So I'm going to start him right here, and I'm going to drop a keyframe camera keyframe right there. And then we're going to go see that you get all that free parallax. Look at that. That is so cool. I love it. For animatic making. Right. It seems makes it seem high budget, which it already just with that little little bit. That's super cool. So, whoops, to get that back to the. All right. So All I right. know for on uh, most of these um, collaboratory. Uh, demonstrations you're always storyboarding straight ahead because there's very little time but on an actual uh production where you have a little bit more time how much are you storyboarding straight ahead and how much are you experimenting with different compositions and different shots for each scene um it depends um it depends on the nature of the shot you know um sometimes it's good because you have to have um sort of like putting up your tent poles before you put the tent over um if you're yeah. familiar with those old school tents that don't just like pop up and then, <laughs> um, but uh, um, you sort of sometimes you have to plan things out really well and other times you just like all right what's comes next shot 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 uh, I had a director on the Simpsons who um, whenever he did a, a, a sh an episode he had his script and he would write down um, medium shot close-up shot long shot oh wow you know and he would he would plan all the shots so he wasn't doing a two shot to two shot or you know something like that if it didn't require it um, to go like over the shoulder over the shoulder over the shoulder or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, and one of the things that we can do in three D and two D is we can put mixtures in between with two D and three D shots. So um, I'm going to do another shot here. I'm going to go back to my stage view. And then this is a, a 2D scene here. Um, and in my library, I'm going to, again, grab that same airship, pull it into here. I'm going to render it to 2D. And uh, we are going to zoom out a little bit and uh, rotate it around. Then zoom in quite a bit and uh, let's get a shot like a like a very like extreme upshot for so we can see like the 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 new girlfriend. It's gonna be a, a reveal shot. Sure. Hold on. Sometimes it takes a little bit of tweaking to to get like the right the right thing. So I had a, a question about um, posing. Um, I know that uh, uh, some people are are concerned with how many poses um, are expected of storyboard artists uh, these days and that basically storyboards are having to be practically animated. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think that, um, you know, character layout, having been a character layout artist in the past, mm -hmm. I think that was a very, very important uh, job that has kind of gotten um, lumped into um storyboards which i don't think it's necessarily a very good thing um because it's it sort of i don't know it uh it's it's sort of like over time you can see the creep in on it where where two jobs get combined to save money so mm -hmm. like as an art form i think if, if you're gonna well as an art form you just should go straight from boards to animation but um, having sort of lumping in character layout with storyboards, I don't think is fair uh, in a lot of ways. But I mean, it's the job. You, people, um, you know, they know what they sign up for most of the time. So, I mean, 
you can't totally fault studios for for wanting to save some money, even if they're you know because a lot of their budgets are super tight as it mm-hmm. is. But I mean, by the same token, like when is it enough? <laughs> right. Because you're you're doing you're doing layout, you're doing the actual storyboarding, and yeah, as we've and- mentioned previously, the the set design, prop design, possibly character design, all these things, and basically animating it. Um, it can yeah. Be- so I'm trying. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to finagle this thing into like a really nice upshot so we can see like. Oh yeah. Homegirl coming out, but um. It, it's 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 a, a bit tricky to to maneuver uh this here, so. You might have to. You might have to just go straight up two D on that one. Sure, and I haven't. Uh, those doors don't open at the moment, <laughs> so I wasn't yeah. sure if that's where you wanted her to come from. So I think what we're what we'll do is we'll just go straight up two D on that one, and um, so we're not you know having to finagle so much. And that's good to show people too that you can mix a three D shot and a two D shot and have it flip. Absolutely, back and forth. I'm just gonna uh, do a gray right here, and then we'll we'll put in a, a small like bit of perspective here. So we can, you know, it's, it's always good to plan out, plan out stuff a little bit if you can. Um, so like here are those doors, right? If I if I look on on this, I can sort of get a, a bead on on what was right there. Mm-hmm. So then the the helm wheel would be here, and we'd have some like, you know, stairs. This would come out. All right. Now that we've got sort of a rough idea, we can get it into the composition. And this is where like those uh, perspective guides really come in handy. Oh yeah. But you get for an um, upshot where you get like the depth. Yeah. Another trick you can do is using this perspective tool. Oh, hey, look at that. You can even get, uh, and there's two ways you can do it. You can do it with the uh, perspective or the lattice. And the lattice is a little bit more uh, forgiving as far as like fine motor control. Mm -hmm. And there's some different settings, right? With vector tools where you can select either a single stroke or everything connected to the stroke. And that would affect what you're um, manipulating there, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You got to make sure it's have your settings right so it merges. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So on the, on the, the thought of um, doing lots of poses and storyboards, if you had a character that was doing a small repetitive movement, like waving their hand or knocking on a door, would you pose it out and then loop the poses or would you make it one panel that was indicating the repetitive mo- motion? Um, again, it really depends on on what you're trying to accomplish there. If the repetitive motion is part of like the story, then I would say put in the repetitive motion. But if it's not, and if it's just like something that the character is doing, then you can usually indicate a cycle and say, "Animation, you do this," <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, so if it was like an incidental wave, maybe you'd put it in the background as one frame. But if it was like a close up of a hand knocking on a door, you would pose out the each part of the knock. Uh, yeah, conceivably. All right, so this is really derpy perspective. Sorry, guys. And not totally what I'm looking for, but um, I think it for the, for the purposes of this, that it should, should be okay. We've got that wheel up here, and we've got Captain Cupid. He's going to be behind this. So we're going to see him in an, in an upshot like this. And then I think what we're going to see is... Um, gonna get rid of this blue here we don't need it now and also I'm going to select I'm gonna shift select both of these so I can select them all at the same time and uh, I'm gonna bring that down into the composition a little bit more and I'm also going to stretch that out a bit and then on the thumbs layer underneath we're gonna put um, the the balloon here in the back. Oh yeah, the zeppelin balloon thing. Yeah, and then like the the back pole or or something. 
right there. And then we'll have our courageous captain, courageous captain Cupid up here with his billowing plume. Again, sometimes we have to just describe as much as we can in, in little stick figures and such. Mm -hmm. Economy, right. economy of line. Yep, economy of line. Mm -hmm. All right. And then let's have um, this door open here a little bit and have uh, the new one, the, the new, the, the current girlfriend. I'm wow. excited to see what you decide she look, looks like. <laughs> um, I, I would think Cupid, Cupid would have a pretty good beat on, you know, a, a nice looking lady. Mm -hmm. But is, is she a Cupid? Uh, probably not. No? Nah. Nah, she's a civilian. There's only, there's only one Cupid. So now I'm going to just add a little uh, background right here so we can see that there's you know, something back there. And uh, yeah. have this uh, have this girl on a separate layer. Oh, here she is. And she's going to have a, her hand down here. Is she going to be piratey too? Or is yeah. she more damsel? She's more damsel, I think. Ooh. She's gonna have like one of those, uh, you know, wrap toga type things or something. Sweet. The hair blowing in the wind. <laughs> Excellent. You know, the not quite forlorn, but like not entirely sure what to expect. Mm -hmm. You know, like how much longer am I have to stay down here? <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned before um, that uh, the director would make these notes about uh, close-up shot, uh, medium shot, uh, whatnot on the actual like script he would hang he would hand out to avoid yeah. um, similar shots back and forth. So I know that there's there's some kind of um, rule of thumb beginner beginner rules like that and the 180 rule that are kind of um, try to avoid newbie mistakes in storyboarding. I'm curious, as a veteran in storyboarding, how often do you find yourself accidentally making those kinds of mistakes? And is it something you have to consciously think about, or is it like an instinct at this point? Um, I don't know. Uh, in some ways, there's instinct that you that you kind of do, and it's like, but you always have that feeling of, oh, this looks wrong. Like there's something mm. wrong here that I need to address. Sometimes mm -hmm. you don't exactly know what it is right off the bat, but um, you know, sometimes you just figure it out like really quickly. Mm -hmm. So then the other side of that coin is um, how often do you find yourself intentionally making a conscious choice to break one of those rules, like the 180 rule for the sake of the storytelling beat or the shot or whatever have you? Um, more often than I'd like to admit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We don't talk about that. <laughs> I, know that I don't know. I, it, it's sometimes you're trying to get a certain effect. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in, in some places that I've seen, like, uh, that, that sort of breaking of the 180 rules seems to be almost in vogue, you know, where they're, they're doing it on purpose for, right. to, to obtain certain effects. But, um, you know, a lot of the time, uh, you know, they say uh, boarding is reboarding, right? <laughs> so where um, you'll you'll work on something, and then you'll realize, oh, you know, after your your first, what I like to call the vomit pass, which is just you get oh. it out there, you just get yeah. it out, everything's yeah, yeah. out there, you thumbnail the heck out of it, you get it out there, it's on the board, and uh, you know, you you've got it, um, you've got it just 
in a state that you can now analyze it and work with it. And um, you can start to, you know, manipulate it into what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, you can't edit a blank page. Yes, you can't edit a blank page. And that's very, very apparent in storyboarding. So mm -hmm. sometimes after your vomit pass, you realize, oh crap, I like crossed the 180 like five times. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I should figure out exactly where I need to put, uh, where I need to put all of my, my shots. And drawing things like maps really helps. Um, you know, that's always, that's always pr pretty, pretty nice. Okay, here mm -hmm. we go. Now we're going to do a new shot. And she's basically saying, uh, you know, how long am I going to have to be down here for? <laughs> Getting and cabin fever in this, this cabin. <laughs> and I think we can do a shot um, where we're looking like down on the deck from his point of view. Uh, and that will just be really quick. We can just drop a little perspective right here. And then... Um, the railing, top of the railing, and for characters, we'll have him like up here, large, with his hands on the on the wheel. Mm -hmm. And she's down here. Actually, we'll compositionally we'll move this over a little bit, so it's not in the way, and we can put her right here. Frame her nice. That's nice. And frame her. We'll, we'll, we'll give uh, Cupid that sort of smooth. <laughs> the smitten look. <laughs> Don't worry, baby. We're almost there. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> So yeah, the um, since we're running out of time, we're not gonna we're not gonna go into amazing detail with these characters. She's so concerned. Um, mentioned that uh, the one eighty being in in vogue right now and trying to create a certain look um, makes sense because uh, you think about these rules and that like why why is the rule there and the one eighty rule is to prevent. Uh, someone becoming disoriented. Um, but if you yes. have a shot like where the, you want the viewer to be disoriented, then that might be a, a place where you intentionally break the 180 rule. Well, okay. absolutely. Absolutely. If you're looking to like have that uh, like confusion, you know, where, you know, it, it, it makes me think of like uh, somebody lost in a maze or something like that, you mm -hmm. know, where you, oh, sure. you have this, uh, this, um, you know, confusion that you want to convey. And so you can show them entering and, and, and leaving in different places, you know, right mm -hmm. and left and, and uh, back and forth and some of those things to really drive home that idea that um, they're lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or the, um, I think the most famous example of intentionally breaking the 180 rule is the um, the Golem Schmeagel bit, right? Um, no, himself. actually, no, th that, that one doesn't. That um, the count? Gollum, Gollum Schmeagel bit, um, that actually is classic Don't Cross the 180. Because you have um, him talking, and then he turns around and looks, and then you you cut to these right and left. You know, he's on the right side. Um, Schmeagel's, on, uh, Schmeagel's on the right, and then Gollum is on the left. Yeah, and then, but it's the same person. And but so it's, it's the same person, but it's just very clever cutting. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're breaking the 180 rule in a way that doesn't look like they're breaking the 180 rule because they're making it look like two different people, even though it's the same person. Yeah. Well, yeah. they're, they're using, they're using the 180 rule to its really proper effect mm -hmm. is what I, is what I would say. Um, and I remember when, when that was, you know, when I first saw those movies, um, I was just like, man, this is, this is just some good classic filmmaking. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So he says, "Ah, oh, don't worry, baby. Um, we'll 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 be at our destination soon." And then I think we he should hear like some sort of horn, you know. 
some sort of announcement. Oh, I like how you're reusing, you're reusing your drawings. Yes, that's one thing that I always talk about here on the collaboratory is that like, if you've already drawn something, you can manip manipulate the vectors here and, uh, you know, be able to reuse stuff. I mean, that's one of the glory, uh, one of the glorious things about digital storyboarding is that it gives you that, um, that latitude to be able to, yeah. to do that. So, and then, um, I'm going to have her react after he, he's reacted. She doesn't know quite where to look. And then we have another reveal shot. Yeah. I think what we're going to do is um, copy that shot. Of course, get rid of our underdrawings. And then um, we're going to use the camera right here. Drop Ooh. some keyframes. And uh, we're going to have we're going to have old Cupid here look behind him. So we're re since we're doing 3D, we're really utilizing camera moves, which is great and dynamic, and we can do that. How often do you use camera moves um, for for an actual production? Like, how much? Are, how often are you producing a storyboard versus an animatic? Oh, we, we produce animatics almost exclusively now. I mean, yeah. uh, well, I mean, again, it's uh, it's pretty show specific. Um, in a lot of ways. We can use, um, I suppose we could use uh, camera moves though, even for just a storyboard, because it'll just set the progressive frames um, yeah. to flip through. I mean, camera moves, you, you don't want to move, move your camera all the time, but um, when when you're trying to make a certain effect, like in this case, uh, the camera is moving so he can, you know, kind of show what's behind him mm -hmm. a little bit. We can see him looking over his shoulder. And then if I copy that, make sure that I delete the, the new keyframes that it makes because it makes an exact duplicate of the other. And then I'm going to just cut that really quick and then give her another reaction of looking back at him. And for that, I'm going to just reuse this pose that I had before. And just change a couple little things. So we had a suggestion earlier that um, one of we mentioned the guns earlier. We had another suggestion that maybe there wasn't guns, and maybe the ex-girlfriend who shows up in her boat threatens to crash her boat into his boat. There you go. Like or maybe, maybe take it over. Ramming speed, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Now there's a couple things I'm going to do. This is going to be a 3D shot, and now I'm going to take some of those elements that I had here. I'm gonna take this uh, this large vector here and uh, go to my um, look at selected view. And I'm gonna copy this and then I'm gonna put it on layer A. So now I'm gonna have this like that. And then I'm also gonna put it on layer B and I'm gonna put it on layer C. Then we're going to, um, take some of those clouds from that previous shot too. So we don't have to redraw clouds and I'm going to go to layer B, um, look at selected and then shift M so I can see what my selection is. I'm going to copy those clouds and I'm going to paste them on another layer. 
we're going to do the same thing for um, these other, other clouds here. So copy those, and then we're going to paste them. All right. So you're probably wondering why the heck are we doing that? Well, I'm going to show you. We are going to import the 3D model. So we're going to go to our library, and we're going to go to that same airship model FBX, and we're just going to drag it on the stage. Boom. Now this time we're going to use as 3D model. So now we have this ship here, and we are going to um, put that into a folder, right? So now we have 3D model, and it's and it's turned the whole scene into a 3D scene. So now we have this, right? We've got a, a, a an airship that's bisected. <laughs> And if we look on our camera view here, we, we get a really funky funky view of the camera. So now we're going to build a little bit of a 3D set, right? Let's zoom out. And I'm going to take this uh, layer here, and then uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it like that. So in my tool properties, now I can see that there is um, a, a property that is different right here. So I have this at 180. This is 88.91. So obviously that's the one that I turned because it's a, a, a weird number. We're going to turn that to 90. So we've got that. And now we're going to take, using our layer uh, transformation tool, again, center on pivot, or center a pivot on selection. And we're going to move this over here. And it's, it's, you, can, you can tell that the camera is clipping a little bit. And that's fine. It, it, that won't matter quite as much. All right. Now I'm building kind of like a uh, sunshade set. Hey, you're creating a, a surround surrounding I'm a, for it. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm making a surrounding environment. So you can kind of see that it's clipping a little bit still. And I'm going to turn this off so you can kind of see what we're actually looking at. Since they're all the same color, it won't really matter so much. Now, I'm going to do everything on this group layer here. Um, so doing the layer transform, I can shrink this down. And one of the, one of the uh, neat tools that I think we don't really see that much is um, if you, you, can, you, you can move it up and down according to everything on this, uh, uh, this 3D gizmo here. But if you go to the corners, you can scale uniformly. Very cool. You don't need to press shift or anything? It just automatically is uniform? Yeah, automatically is uniformed. Very nice. So there we go. Now we see what we're seeing in our camera view. And we can either manipulate our camera view or we can manipulate um, the airship itself. But I think it's easier to manipulate the camera than it is to manipulate anything else. So let's get our clouds in, in place here. Um, we're going to go back to our layer transformation tool and we're going to see exactly where those clouds are, are, are sitting. Um, and they are at 90 degrees. So we will take the other cloud layer, make sure we have it on the right thing. Nope. There it is. We're going to manipulate those as well. So do you think um, beginner um, storyboard artists, do they tend to move the camera too little or too much? I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's pretty individualized, I think. I mean, there's no, there's no hard and fast answer. No, no pattern you've, see, you've seen of uh, beginner mistakes in that regard? No, I think everyone's different. Some people they don't use the, utilize the camera enough. Mm -hmm. Some people uh, use it too much. Okay. I mean, it, so it's, we'll it's 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 very us. it's a highly individualized thing. Okay, All right. that's good to know. Now with our layers palette, we can pick the things that we need to manipulate, and move around. Um, this is a clouds layer. Where's B? Where do we have our B here? That one's over here. And I think also what we can do is we can just tilt this like that. So we have an even even more of a spread for our 3D background. 
So how does, if you're moving, the clouds or the, the blue? I'm moving the blue. So how does, how does that, since it's all the same color, how is tilting it going to make a visible difference? Well, because it's, it's got a bigger cone of, uh, of um, you know, spread. So you're going to have the, the clouds run parallel to those planes? Is that what you're going to do? Yeah, parallel to this back one, actually. Okay. These, these clouds here. Oh, they got pasted onto this background layer, so. Oh. Yeah, we, won't, we won't worry about that one, I suppose. I mean, you could move the whole blue plane. It would look pretty similar. Okay. Now, if we get our camera, we can we can see our little camera right here. And it used in this in this top view, we can start to move that into position. And I think we should since we've we've had this on the right side for the most part, we can keep that where it was. And right now we're only looking at this top view. Um, so if we come down here back to the stage view, now we can start to manipulate that in 3D space. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a little bit of closer view up here. And one of the cool things about using the 3D camera is that you can, um, you know, you can tilt up and down. Nice. You can get instant tilt. So you're selecting the and camera, you, you, can, you can get, you know, you can tilt your camera all the way up and down. Or you can um, tilt it downward and we can see a little bit, you know, more of the deck. Let's it's, an, it's a nice, easy way to play with composition. Absolutely. And and one of the things about 3D that's really great is that it, it works so well for playing with composition. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just have a, just a little bit of air on the right. And then we are going to add another 2D layer. So I'm just going to put it on this, on this thumbs layer. Um, and then we are going to... Actually, I'm going to draw right here on the camera view. So moving this a little bit over. Now we can zoom out and see like what we've got. Um, camera is still, we need a little bit more, a little bit more space on that. So I think that the airship still needs to be bigger in the composition. So getting that camera tool back out. Selecting our camera. Going further that way, more this way. And again, that's you know one of the things that, that 3D, it does take a little bit longer, but you do get some really stunning results. Yeah, yeah, and it can be really hard to duplicate some of that in 2D. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does it kind of uh, shake up your workflow a little bit and can make a feels a little bit refreshing to have a, a change? Sometimes. Sometimes you just need to get the, the shot down, but um, other times, you know, it does really make a big difference. Yeah. Even if even if it's a challenge, it can be a All maybe right. be nice to be challenged. <laughs> now one yes, yeah, sure. Sure. And I'm gonna um, uh, look at selected. And then I'm going to create uh, a new layer. And one of the tricks that I like to do is um, just to use the uh, uh, rectangle tool and just draw something. Um, generally, I'll you know do like a slightly colored layer or something like. In this case, maybe just make it like you know like a little off yellow. Delete that. That way, I can I can take my my plane here and position it in the space that I need it to be in. Right. So, using this, I can um, center on on the piece of uh, vector here. Using my hand tool, I can go you know back and forth, 
and then I'm gonna take this this piece of um, this this uh, I don't know what the right word is kind of card I guess, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna position that card where I need it to be in 3D space. Now I can do that here on this. And again, sometimes it takes a little bit of finagling to do where you're working with the interface. Then I can translate that on the y-axis. So what are you doing with this plane? This plane is going to be where is is going to be where I'm going to draw keep it on. Oh. And so you mentioned before the whole uh, look at selection right button, yep. and so you have to be exactly perpendicular in order to for, in order to actually have the the system let you alter it so that it doesn't get skewed. Yep, and so I will look at selected. Now I've got it right here, and it's showing me the back. That's fine. It's not too big of a deal. Um, now I get my pencil out, and I can start, uh, or my pen out, and I can start drawing on it. Now this is one of the one of the trickier trickier things, because uh, you know obviously I, I I won't be able to to draw on it directly, in 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 some cases like in this case, but I can approximate you can see where where that's sort of sort of heading so uh i can do my best guesses could you make it semi-transparent would that help no well, i guess i guess it would huh let's do that go boop we'll turn it slightly green And then um, we'll mirror image that so we can see uh, our dear captains looking in the right, right way. So if you had a, a shot like, like this where you're having um, two, two of, the th of the same thing in theory, which in this case would be two airships, um, would you want to reuse the same 3D asset twice, um, or would that be? Um, oh, she's not an airship. She's not an airship. No. Oh. No, no, no. Let's not do. Let's not repeat ourselves. I see. And then another thing we can we can do. So it's this is a little bit off, obviously. So I can, um, you know, make sure that this goes in the right spot by just making this as close to that wheel as possible. So now we have stuff that aligns a little bit better. And this uh, on the left is our actual shot. Yes. Yeah. On the left is our actual shot, yes. Um, and so do we have, is that the right um, aspect ratio? Or how do you, how do you tell um, in this sort of in in the interface, what your aspect ratio would be? For your um, aspect ratio, as far as like your whole composition. Yeah, or is it? Oh, just got the. Yeah, just the, the camera view. The camera view is what shows you. Okay, so you have the. It, you wouldn't be able to just zoom out indefinitely. You have the um, the frame around it. Yeah. So. This is a little tricky. So sometimes when you're doing 3D boards, it, it kind of looks a little bit stickly. But you know, honestly, if we had more time, we would set this up in a very different way. So um, 3D can be a bit of a learning curve, but um, it does produce some pretty spectacular effects. Mm -hmm. So but the neat thing about putting the that plane right where you did is it's automatically putting like as you as you can see as you're drawing, you're drawing straight lines, but it's it's automatically placing the lines behind the wheel and hiding the parts that are behind the wheel. Sure is. So you don't have to worry about, about trying to make it look like it's behind because it is actually behind. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the cool things about it. So um, then now I can uh, drop in a new layer 
And uh, that layer can um, one of the one of the tricks that sometimes is easy to do is just do your your artwork on a two D layer. So in this case, I think what we'll do is um, I think she should have some some sort of thing. Maybe she's uh, stolen like Apollo's chariot Ooh. <laughs> and it's riding that. You know. Um, so why don't we just do this where we've got this chariot like that. And we've got, you know, the sun horses. <laughs> and we'll have, she has, uh, is it like a, a Valkyrie mask or something? Yeah, like a battle maid in Athena. Sweet. <laughs> With her righteous fury. Yeah. Athena was uh, the the goddess of of like fighting, right? Yeah. Oh, I think they had they wore lots of hats. They were the gods and goddesses of many things. Right. I used to really be into Greek mythology when I was in middle school. Oh yeah. Uh, that stuff really really fascinated me. I loved the storytelling aspect of it. You know, with the different, um, and the the different aspects of of it. You know. Oh yeah, it was drama. Like the those were not perfect gods. They were very imperfect and all sorts of drama amongst them. Cupid, how dare you? <laughs> oh crap. <laughs> yeah, you don't uh, you don't want to cross that's that's a that is a a bad woman to scorn right there. Absolutely. Let's have her, uh, let's clear out that uh, composition. Or that silhouette, rather. I was going to ask, ask about clearing what silhouette um, composition. That's what I meant to say, is silhouette. Oops. So, um, so this is, I, thought, I think this is super, super creative, uh, coming up with the idea of um, Athena with her chariot and the horses. Uh, and you're drawing from something uh, that was an interest in a hobby from, from childhood, um, which I think is, is great. Um, so it really kind of pushes home the idea that you gotta have all sorts of um, hobbies um, in your life so that you can have stuff to draw from and then bring into your work. Well, sure. I mean, and it's all a matter of like, what do you like? Mm -hmm. You know, some, some people like, um, you know, drawing things like this, uh, you know, action-y stuff. Some people like doing more, you know, subtle things, more, uh, you know, various types of comedy. Other people like doing a lot of different things. So, I mean, there's no, there's no one that can tell you what you like to draw, but you, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that, that sometimes we get so caught up in, I want to get a job, I want to get a job, I want to get a job, that we don't really you know respond anymore to the stuff that we know we like. <laughs> We're just like, mm -hmm. I just want a job. I will do anything you want. <laughs> you know, Just hire me. Sure. And I think that's sure. a little disingenuous where you're betraying yourself for, for a job that may or may not come, you know? Mm -hmm. What do you think about... Um how much you need to push yourself outside of um, the 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 popular uh, in terms of, of what you like, like because because some people get uh, get feeling like like what they produce is is the same stuff that people see all the time, and there's there's nothing fresh, nothing new, nothing original, um, because the stuff that they they like is the stuff that's big and popular and everyone likes. Um, what do you think about how much does a person need to push themselves to find find obscure things that they like? I don't think obscurity necessarily is a virtue or or a detriment. Um, if you if there's something you like that happens to be popular at the time, great. If it's not popular at the time, that's fine too. I mean, like you know, um, zombies have kind of gotten 
a bit played out, you know. But if you like drawing zombies, then by all means, draw zombies. Mm -hmm. They come back, yeah. you know. But uh, popularity isn't really something that I like to factor in because popularity is so fleeting. Mm -hmm. Something that's popular one day, you know, could be junk the next day. So, and we have we have a, a, a media that just moves so fast that like, how do you keep up with what's whatever's trending unless you're always, always on trend? Mm -hmm. So I don't think that, you know, you really need to worry about what's popular and what's not just draw what you like and that will shine through. Yeah. I like that. It's about the passion. Uh, we have a question here from Sarah Fuji. E? Hi, Sarah I Fuji. A, she has a question about story ideas. If we give out story ideas, is it possible to have full say in the story's rights? Cause she does have an idea. Are you for talking about for this stream? Um, or in general. I'm not sure um, if, uh, Sarah, if you're still there, if you can clarify, but uh, I'm assuming if she's a pitching, if she wants to pitch a story, um, maybe to a studio, um, does she have full say in the story's rights? Mm, depends on what deal you make. If you're selling something to a studio, then obviously you've sold it to the studio. So at that point, you know, I've, I've heard of, uh, you know, people getting a deal with a studio and then the studio doesn't want them to actually be part of it. They just want to take the idea and run. Cool. Like there, there are situations like that, but you know, honestly, like most of the time, if they're buying an idea from you, they want you to be part of the idea because I mean, that's your idea. But, um, you know, uh, again, it's, it's, uh, that's a legal question more than anything else. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to, I'm going to paste this into a different layer. So boof, there, there it goes. Now I've done that drawing in 2D and I can now manipulate that into uh, into this scene, right? So Sarah says, yes, she would like to, to pitch. So so I think the answer there, since Sarah, is it depends on what your contract is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, read the fine print. Okay, it looks like we have about 10 minutes left. So we're gonna... Um, play the animatic once you have it in a, uh, in a state where you think you can do so. Mike. All right. Yep. Let's do that. All right. So, um, and again, we knew that going in that this one was going to be a little bit shorter than other, other times. It's a lot more tech talk. Yeah, definitely a lot more, a lot more technical than what we, what we're normally doing. Um, and again, navigating that 3d scene. Oh, she's on the wrong side. So we're going to have to, uh, take her over here. And then using this, we're going to have to flip this down to a negative one, <laughs> negative 90. All right. And I like then... that it's, it's visual. You can see exactly what you're doing. <laughs> so I've just typing numbers and hoping and praying that you're doing it in the right spots. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so now we've got this here and uh, we can, we can see it now in our camera view. And we can, we can uh, just turn this off. And I think we need one more shot, just a single of uh, of Cupid. And we'll just arrow him back over. That's a man who knows what he's up against. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he is. He is not. Uh, he, he knows exactly what Athena is. <laughs> I think that's why he left her because she's just so aggressive. <laughs> I'm a sucker for um, expressive facial expressions. They just get me. 
All right. So now that we've done a lot of this technical stuff, we have Captain Cupid uh, in his airship just sailing along the breezes. Out comes his uh, new girlfriend who says, uh, uh, Cupid, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to make this bigger so we can see the whole camera view. Cupid, how much longer am I going to have to be down here? Uh, don't worry, baby. It'll be fine. And then, then, Whoa. What's that? Uh, I hope it's not what I think it is. And then we, yeah, yeah, get back here, Cupid. I'm not done with you. It's Athena. Hold on. And then uh, <laughs> if we were really uh, kind of wanting to be cool about it, then we could um, just do like a simple camera move. And um, do, do a, ro a tilt camera. Watch. We'll do this. And then we will tilt this camera this away. And that will give us that. Oh. And as he as he like turns the wheel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's moving the whole ship. Yep. And then that's a that's a little uh, fun camera trick that uh, is pretty effective actually. Grab that down. Grab this little pivot point. Whoops, wrong wrong tool. This little pivot point and just put it down here. And that way we can just turn the vector without having to get too crazy with it. All right. All right. Hold on to your butts, you know. <laughs> yes. Hold on to your butt, as, uh, as Samuel L. Jackson would say in Jurassic Park. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. You know, because mm -hmm. it's things so simple, but it's so like it tells the story so well yeah, like things about to get crazy and then <laughs> I love and it then, you know if we, if we really got into into this a little bit further we could animate this layer here and whenever I'm animating the layer I usually like to put that layer inside of a group and then um, animate the group but we can um, get back to our uh, top view here and if we push home, we go to the front of that, um, to the, the the front of that layer in the timeline. Then we push end. We go to the back, and then we can uh, have our second keyframe here. And uh, it's Athena, and she's pissed as usual. Then go into our stage view. We can manipulate that a little bit so we can see what we're doing. And here's Athena. And then we will just um, drop that second keyframe, move her forward in space. We got a, a, a compliment from Zemo Kuli Thusi. He says, uh, I always learn plenty from these boarding demos, Mike. So awesome to witness. Thanks, bud. I'm glad that you're getting something out of it because uh, that's that's the point, really, you know? Yeah, um, I concur. It's amazing. To also, watch. we can do um, another camera keyframe, and then we can just push that camera forward a little bit. Oops. So you mentioned that you pretty much exclusively do animatics um, at the studios, would you suggest that aspiring storyboard artists put uh, click-through storyboards or animatics in their um, online portfolios? Um, click-throughs are great. Um, animatics are great. I mean, animatic, you have um, the the advantage of being able to include music and sound effects and, and dialogue. I that's the advantage, but if you don't care, or if you don't have time, then a click through is fine. I'd, I'd heard that some hiring managers, they don't have time to watch animatics and they prefer click throughs. You don't think that's the case? I, I couldn't say. I'm not a hiring manager. Okay, but you would you prefer. Some, some people do. Um, I mean, again, there's no hard and fast rule because there's no hard and fast rule for people. Like, 
you do what you think is best, what you think is is good. Or, I mean, best of both worlds, you could always put a click through and the animatic mm -hmm. like side yeah. by side. So, you know, it'd be like, well, if they have time for a click through, then click, 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 click. If they don't have time or if they have time to watch an animatic, they just push play. I mean, yeah. give them options. Them both and hedge options. Your bets. <laughs> I like it. All right, cool. Any other questions? We've got like a couple of minutes and then we're out. Um, I'm not see. We have um, some comments about, uh, I don't know who I'm, I'm out of the loop. I don't know who this, we got a, a Guillermo Fromo Reyes says, Bruno Trabin arriving in Tampico after his boat sunk. I'm sure it's a reference to something. I'm not sure what that is, um, but it's a it's a comment. And I wanted to make sure it got noticed. All right. Well, thank you for your comment. I'm not sure I understand it either or the, what the reference is, but uh, <laughs> hey, uh, Silencio Bruno. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's about engagement. I appreciate the engagement. About engagement. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a little a little bit of uh, of camera like helps that right there. He's pushing that camera forward. One of the cool things you get is you get that nice three D view and and things change in three D. So um, mm -hmm. it's dramatic. It's a lot more yeah, dynamic. It makes it it makes it dynamic and dramatic. And you know, honestly, if you have time to like mess with it and really get into that performance and stuff, you can do really great things. So the 3D options in Storyboard Pro are really fantastic and um, are worthy of being explored, especially if you um, have a have a you know a little bit of a knack for using 3D software like Blender uh, or Maya or whatever. Uh, personally, I use Blender most often because again, it's free and it's really good. Mm -hmm. So why not? Oh yeah, and it's it's totally competitive with all the other industry software. Um, so it's absolutely worth it. A little bit of a learning curve if you don't know any 3D, but it can be rewarding. So for those of you who don't have Storyboard Pro and are looking to get Storyboard Pro, there is a 21-day trial that you can try out. Uh, just go to toonboom.com and uh, find Storyboard Pro, and you can download the trial version and mess with around with it for 21 days. Um, if you are going to do 3D work, may I suggest that you do your 3D work first and then get your 21-day trial started and do some 3D storyboarding. Yes, excellent. Well, thank you, Mike, for joining us once again for Collaboratory. Do you have any other projects that you would like to draw attention to upcoming or anything? Well, um, right now I'm working on a website for Animation Dance Party. So uh, stay tuned and uh, check out animation animationdanceparty.com when it is live. Awesome. Well, this turned out great. And I, I mean, that's the, the promoting it right behind you also as well <laughs> everyone should go check out animation dance party there's um it's on youtube to to view the previous years um thank you everyone for for joining for collaboratory um if mike morris can draw a pirate cupid on a 3d spaceship being chased by his ex-girlfriend athena in a chariot uh, being drawn by flame horses in about an hour Think what you could draw in about three weeks. Uh, so, or, you know, or what you could put into your portfolio. You can download a 21 day trial of Storyboard Pro, like Mike said, at the website at toonboom.com and find free video tutorials at learn.toonboom.com. And if you're looking for more interviews, be sure to visit blog.toonboom.com for articles about storyboarding, animation, and 2D games. Until next time, thanks for joining. See you, everybody. Bye.